Hey, it's Jen. Have you ever listened to one of the episodes and thought to yourself, oh, I wish I could leave a response to that, or I wish I could leave feedback or ask a question? Did you know there's actually a way to do that in Spotify now? I know, it's super cool. So if you head over to Spotify and search for Java with Jen podcast or Java with Jen hearing God's voice for everyday life, you may have to search all of it. And then you go and check out my most recent episodes. There are polls and Q&A options that you can weigh in on and I can connect with you that way over here on this platform. I usually use Instagram to connect with you guys, but now with this feature from Spotify, it's a super cool way to engage with the content of each episode and talk to me directly. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. So go head over to my latest episodes on Spotify and let's do that right now. Welcome to episode number four, which I'm calling Missions, Money, Ministry, and Marriage with my special guest, Stephen Samuel. Have you ever wanted to dig around inside the mind of your pastor and see what things might be like from his perspective? Well, every pastor is a little different. However, Stephen Samuel, who's also my husband, has been pastoring since he was 16 years old. He also has a passion for missions and has traveled to dozens of nations, preaching the message of Jesus, healing sick people, and casting out demons as well. So he has got some fun insights to share with you today. For the show, I opened up a forum on Facebook and took questions from all of you so we could dive right into the good stuff that you would be wondering on topics from missions to money to ministry and marriage. Listen till the end for our life hack segment to hear more of his favorite time-saving life managing tips and how to do more ministry from right where you are. We get super practical and hopefully this episode will inspire you both in your daily life and walk with Jesus and your pursuit of the things that God has for you. And now on with the show. Hi, and you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenilee Samuel. All right, welcome to Java with Jen. This is your host, Jenna Lee Samuel, and I have with myself a special guest, Stephen Samuel, who is my husband. Stephen, mm-hmm. you want to say hi to the people? Hi to the people. Hi to the people. <laughs> and so, Stephen, why don't you give a little bit of background about what you do and where we're going to go on today's show? Okay. Um, well, my wife and I, we serve at Cathedral Church here in Beaumont. We are over the missions department and over our school of ministry, and over a lot of the discipleship that happens here at the church as far as life classes, life groups, and things like that. And um, I've been serving in the ministry for 22 years now, and I graduated from Lamar University in Beaumont, Mm -hmm. and Midwest College of Theology in Coker, Missouri, and... uh, Where are you originally from? I was born in South India in Chennai, formerly called Madras. And I came to the U.S. when I was about, when my parents at five years old. Which is why he does not have an accent. And I have no accent. <laughs> Very good. When we first met, we met over the phone. I was, it's a long story, but I was part of a ministry and I called youth pastors on the phone. And he was one of the youth pastors I called. And uh, I pictured in my head a tall, white, skinny cowboy based on his voice. So you meet him and not he is case. truly Indian. All right. Well, for a little bit of background... Stephen and I have been married for 14 years. Oh, good job, babe. 14 wonderful years. Well, are you going to say your little nope. funny thing? Okay. <laughs> he normally says, but it feels like five minutes. Underwater. <laughs> I've been in the ministry for 22 years, 22 years, uh-huh. serving in youth ministry, uh, leading worship, kids ministry. Kids ministry. Missions. Wait, when did you do kids ministry? The very beginning. Who did you? With your dad's church? Yes. Uh, that would explain why you're so good with the kids. That's exactly it. He's great with kids. He's not afraid to be left with the boys, and I much appreciate it. Okay, so Stephen's passion. You know, what would you say is your passion in ministry? What's your biggest number one? I think missions is a big part. Discipleship. Can you define discipleship? Because a lot of my listeners may be unfamiliar with that. I fact. think just... Helping people in their walk with the Lord, you know, weekly, sometimes regularly meeting with them and walking through stuff, yeah, situations in life. Well, let's go with this first question. Where do you see yourself in 10 years and what is a challenge for you as a pastor? Oh, goodness. Well, I think in 10 years, it's so hard to tell, especially in ministry when you're forecasting because people, um, ministry is not an issue of like 
like a business plan. If the Lord doesn't come back, we'll be doing ministry. I just don't know what capacity. I mean, in the ministry, sure. everyone kind of just follows what the Holy Spirit is telling them to do. And of course, we have a vision for people in this community here in uh, Beaumont, Texas. And so... That's good. So actually, I guess if we were to t- kind of flip that question and take it backwards, like 10 years ago, would you have seen yourself here doing this right now? Um, no, I don't think we ever imagined being doing what we're doing now in the sense of, I mean, we knew we were going to be discipling people, probably not any definite ideas of what, what we're doing now. Where we'd be located and stuff. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So what is a challenge for you as a pastor? Um, the devil's a challenge. <laughs> I mean, the challenges are always, you know, getting people to see the potential they have and getting them to discipline themselves to meet that potential. But, you know, people is what we do. So you have fun people, you have difficult people, but the challenge is always getting people out of the wrong mindset into the truth that they need to experience. Sounds a little bit like parenting. It is parenting. Okay, so for those who are exclusively local and missions-minded, what would you tell them about foreign missions? Like, let's say they can't travel or they just don't have a desire to travel abroad, but they're local. What would you tell them? Mm. Well, I think missions is missions no matter where you are in the sense of there's still people that need to be reached, especially uh, in the United States, a millennial generation, a generation that's post, post-Christian. Um, I think missions is missions wherever you go. If you can't reach people here in Beaumont, Texas, or wherever you live, then... It's not like some great euphoria happens when you get across the across an ocean. And so missions is missions anywhere. I think if you're asking that question in the context of like, what can I do in foreign missions? You know, supporting missionaries, short-term mission trips are always a great idea to be a part. When you say supporting, what do you mean? I mean like financially supporting or praying with or just even regular communication with foreign missionaries is always such a, an asset to them. Um, if you're asking that just in the context of what can we do as in some form of um, comparative sense, then, you know, what you do here is what you do in other places when you go, you know, so if you're used to talking to people, uh, acclimate yourself to engaging people, talking to them about Jesus in a way that's relevant. That's what we do in foreign missions, and that's what you do in local missions. It's the same. Okay. Um, So what has been your favorite trip and why? And what was your most powerful supernatural experience, either on that trip in general? I think... Um, it's, it's hard to pick out a favorite because people are different to various degrees in other countries. And there's things that you like about every culture, nuances that, you know, let's say when you're in Israel or whether you're in South America or, you know, in India or China, there's always the, the things that every culture brings that makes it fun. I think my favorite part of most mission trips is me meeting the culture (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the food, right? And the food is really good. <laughs> and their Starbucks. You know, I, I don't think there's necessarily one specific place that's the most favorite. Uh, we tend to, with our missions, go to the same places over and over again. So it's the relationships that really prove to make a place very significant. Mm. And as that's why, you know, we don't do the shotgun approach of going everywhere all the time. It's we go to the same places where we see God moving and we just keep building relationship with the pastors there. Okay. What has been your most supernatural experience on a mission trip? Oh my goodness. There's so many. <laughs> I think, you know, we regularly see a lot of demonic activity being broken. So you see that. I remember one time we found out the first person we cast a demon out of was the pastor's wife. The second was the pastor's daughter. That was kind of interesting. <laughs> and so... How do you explain that to the pastor? We didn't. <laughs> we just kept on going. <laughs> um, but we've seen miraculous things, uh, you know, people getting healed, blind eyes being open, deaf ears being open. Yeah. I think the most significant or the most powerful is when you go back to a country over and over and you see somebody that you've led to the Lord getting discipled, getting trained up, and then now they're pastoring a church or they're leading a significant part of a ministry. Probably the most fulfilling feeling and seeing people's lives being changed over Mm -hmm. a period of time. Yeah. Which of your sons, if any, do you feel like will devote their lives to foreign missions? All of them. I mean, I don't know if if I can specifically say, you know, they all have a desire for missions, which, I mean, obviously they want to be like mom and dad. And so they all have a desire for missions, how that will look, whether they're missionaries full time or in the business world or the medical world, or, you know, we never get in a position where we try to 
predict that kind of things just because, you know, you don't know what the Lord's going to do and how he's going to do it. And so, yeah. but I feel like them all will, they all will be engaged in serving the Lord, what that looks like yeah. in the context of ministry or not, or mission work or not. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's been neat as they're getting a little bit older. They're all in elementary, and mm-hmm. one of them is in junior high. And I feel like as they've been getting into those age groups, their personalities are evolving in such a way, and their giftings are starting to come out, so that I feel like, even though I don't know how their callings will play out specifically, it's just neat starting to see them start to develop some of their gifts mm-hmm. or seeing their personal nuanced strengths that mm-hmm. I feel like could easily play into ministry roles and stuff and serving the Lord, even in the business field and stuff. So, okay. Uh, Experiencing extreme poverty in other countries, lack of opportunity, lack of healthcare, persecution, et cetera. How does this make you feel about the same in contrast in America? It's always a challenge when you come back from a mission field that's impoverished and you have deplorable levels of poverty. And then you come back to the States and, People are complaining about the wrong mix of Starbucks drink or whatever. I think, um, I, well, first part, how you navigate that is you don't despise the the blessing God's put on your life because of the lack in other people's lives. Right. And how do we navigate that? I think constantly or, or regularly keeping the awareness of how blessed you are and how much you can impact the lives of other people is a big part. Like we give to missions pretty regularly, consistently, I should say, and we give a pretty significant amount because we know we're blessed. And so I think that keeps us in the reality of the need that's out there by being a part of the answer, not just observing the need. Yeah. And so I would say to someone who comes back from a mission trip and you're like, oh, you know, it's easy to become very critical of people who are successful when you see that kind of poverty. Uh, but the that doesn't really lead to any solutions. The solution is you need to become a part of the solu- part of remedying the problem. And a lot of times that means becoming generous and making sacrifices of things that we consider luxury here and are unheard of over there. So we make yeah. sacrifices and give. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, what would you like to say to privileged America to open their eyes and hearts to the reality of others around the world? You know, back in, uh, there's a little phrase, back when uh, Teddy Roosevelt was president, not that I was alive then, but he had this ideology called, uh, I think it was called noblesse oblige, but basically it was a concept of there's a responsibility for people who have privilege, and that responsibility is to take care of those who don't. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, so let's say I'm a middle-class American and I'm living a pretty moderate to successful lifestyle. You know, and I'm a regular church attender and I'm just, you know, I'm tithing. Uh, I think above and beyond the tithe. Now, let's just be frank. Most Americans that are middle class and going to a local church are not tithers. Barner Barner Research tells us that less than 10% of believers are tithers. And so churches don't get into the the operative mode of world missions because they're always trying to just stay ahead of the game with paying their regular operating expenses. And so I think you need to be a tither. And then what do you do above and beyond that? I think people who God has connected you with, and I don't mean just like you met them on Facebook or you met them on social media, but like you have a relationship with and they're in the mission field. I think you need to make a sacrificial and yet consistent lifestyle of giving to them. And by that, I mean, you know, if you can partner with them at a hundred dollars a month or so, in Africa, that's a lot of money. In parts of Africa, that's a lot of money. In Europe, that's not a lot of money, you right. know. Yeah. And so you need to know the relationship well enough to say what would help right. you. And then you have to get into a place where you're financially in a place where you can give and it not be uh, it not be something that, that takes away from, you know, the food on your table and that kind of thing. So there's a balance in the sense of I see a need and I'm willing to make a sacrifice. I can live without you know, 10,000 channels of cable and I can give, you know, something significant out of my life. And because I think at the end of the day, missionaries don't want you to begrudge giving to them. They want you to do it joyfully, just like the scripture says, you know, we don't give out of necessity or grudgingly, but we give with a cheerful heart. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, because we've come across that um, a couple times, 
you know, we mentor and disciple college students. And so in your college season of life, you are not rolling in the dough. And But a lot of our college students have generous hearts and they desire to give sacrificially, like you're saying. Um, but many of them come into the struggle where they're like, I'm struggling to pay my own bills. How do I give sacrificially? So when we use that phrase sacrificially, sometimes I know that when I was younger, I thought that it was more holy to give when I was struggling to pay my bills because it was really sacrificial, you know what I mean? But then I did kind of develop a little bit of a sense of resentment because then I felt untaken care of. I didn't see a lot of fruit from those seeds that I sowed financially. So talk about that a little bit of how you approach that with a practical as well as spiritual perspective. You know, I think practically, if I don't have a lot to give, here's what I do. I pray for money to give. Mm -hmm. And so I pray for opportunities to make money to, whether it's side jobs or whatever, but I ask God to give me wisdom how to raise the resources to give. And then even awareness is a big deal. So like when I go on a mission trip, I come back and I try to make friends aware of what's happening in those areas. So they become the ones that can join with me in supporting or, or getting behind a missionary. Mm-hmm. Money's not the only way to give, though. You can give of your time. You can spend time praying for your missionaries, contacting them regularly and saying, hey, what's going on in your world? How can I pray? Mm-hmm. And then the discipline of making that a regular practice in your life is something missionaries don't see very often. You know, we get really excited about mission work when we see it, see a video or go on a trip, and then we come back, and two months later, you've forgotten about everything. Um, so aggressively choosing to remember and to pray for them, and then financially partner with them is a big deal. Yeah, yeah. I know that I've heard you say that when you give, you're meant to give out of your abundance, meaning that all your responsibilities are taken care of. Bills are paid, debts being paid off, you know, your family's taken care of. Mm -hmm. So what do you constitute as abundance? Because, you know, a lot of times we can think, well, this is my comfort zone in taking care of my bills. Mm -hmm. How do you recognize where the abundance sits? You know, Dave Ramsey has a great strategy, uh, which you can look up his stuff, Dave Ramsey, I'm just Google it or whatever. Uh, but he always talks about, you know, you build a budget. If you don't have a budget, then you don't know if you have an abundance or you're living in poverty. You build a budget. Um, well, let me say that you don't know to what degree you have an abundance or not. Um, so you build a budget. This is what I need to live. And then, of course, you're tithing. And then you build your budget. And then after that, what you have left over to give in alms or benevolence giving or whatever um, is kind of where you start. I think you need to kind of have a number in your head, though, like after you know what it costs to live, whatever you make above that, that's free to give. And I think that concept, or I've read that concept in um, David Platt's book, Radical. Uh, At the very end, the last few chapters, he talks about every family should have a number like 30,000 or 40,000. After we make this much, everything else is going into missions or going to give or benefit the ministry. Um, so, and it also also helps to partner with people, communities, churches that have that vision to give. Because what we find here in the states is like most churches, and I'm not criticizing the church as a whole because I work at one also, but most churches dump money into things that are not fruitful in the long run. You know, we're planning churches and communities that have 500 churches already, <laughs> and we're planning another church when there's communities around the world that have no missionary. Yeah. So I think you need, we need to be smart. And that's, we can't keep putting that on the next person. Like, well, that's the pastor or the missions. Do that. That's like your responsibility to know where your funds are going. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you're supporting a missionary in, in a country where there's, you know, 20% Christian population, then you need to really reconsider like, hey, wh- why am I doing this? Unless God has specifically connected you to that. Yeah. Now, let me ask, and I'm hitting on this because I want to be thorough and practical because I do know that a number of the people listening to this are going to be people struggling with this area and these questions. Mm -hmm. Um, So you just said, you know, build a budget, know what you need to live, and everything above that is Mm -hmm. abundance that you can give into missions. However, that could also leave people in a position where they're not getting ahead, they're just breaking even. You yeah. know what I mean? So how do you build in savings without feeling guilty that you're saving for your family what you could be giving into missions? Sure. You know, I think part of that, if you're married and you're a couple or whatever, you need to pray through that in the sense of y'all come to an agreement. You need to save. Savings is never foolish. I think the rule of thumb that we see kind of throughout the scriptures, and it's not like a hard, fast rule, is 20%. So you're tithing 10%, saving 20%, um, and then you're living off of the 70% that's left. And then if you want to go above and beyond that, I mean, that's up to you. But I think 
savings is important, especially if you've got children, grandchildren coming. If you're not saving, just on a purely economical thing, you're not moving forward financially if you're not saving. Yeah. Even if you're saving $20 a paycheck, you're moving forward. But if you're not saving anything, what's really probably happening is you're going into debt every paycheck. Yeah. And so sometimes that means you have to sell a car instead of having three vehicles, have two instead of having two, go to one. Sometimes that means you downgrade. Uh, you're living in a house that you really can't afford if you're, you know, at ends your pension pennies at the end of every month. And so a lot of people don't like to hear that because we want to live the most affluent way that we can now because we don't see for the future. But if we'll go to a level of moderate living now, Mm -hmm. you'll have money in the future because you'll be able to save now. And uh, I think that's kind of where you start. Okay. I think one principle that we've practiced and that I personally like to practice that um, is helpful and kind of answers a lot of these questions is that we would build giving into our budget. Yep. And so we prioritized the tithe first when we got paid. We prioritized paying all the bills and then, you know, some money for savings. And then we also had built into the budget, I know that I can save this much to give. And so then we were regularly building a savings that was oriented towards with with the goal of we're going to give this away. Yeah, it's basically just a seed account. So like, and even when I do stuff like, you know, do extra work, like, you know, our kids, we chop firewood every once in a while and we make some money off of that. Well, kids get some money out of that and we put the rest of it in to a seed account. It just sits there until somebody comes along and says they have a need and we have money to give. Yeah. Yeah. And I like so. that because then you are, there's a passage in Proverbs that says that a wise man stores up treasures of oil and wine, but a foolish man devours all he has. Mm-hmm. And there's wisdom in setting money aside for needs that you know are coming down the road. And those can be personal needs, like your car will need new tires, or it can be, I want to be prepared when a missionary comes along who has a need, I want to be able to help out. So I think that's a really practical tool. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you for answering all those money questions. People always have those. So how do you find time to read so many books or even to reread books? Um, you know, time is something you have to manage very aggressively because it will slip away. Um, I have a Kindle app on my phone. I have a Kindle app on my MacBook uh, or on my, my iPad or whatever. So I have my books accessible all the time. And then I kind of plan out what to read. So during the day, I tend to read like if I have, you know, 30 minutes in the morning, or whatever, I tend to read more informational books. And then if I am going to bed at night, I tend to read more biographical books because you don't have to work as hard in biographies because it's a story. It's not so much concept after concept. Um, So I kind of plan it out. Now, some people, their brain may be a little more active at night than it is in the morning. I just tend, whenever your brain's more active, to do the information side. Um, And then I audio book. So I listen to books. So I'm driving roughly about an hour a day. So average audio books, I mean, I guess if there is an average, you're looking at six to seven hours. And so if I'm driving an hour a day, then in about a week, week and a half, roughly, I can knock out an audio book. And so an audio book, which is an investment. I mean, it's not free. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an investment, but knock it out via audiobooks, and then I have a Kindle with me everywhere I go, and then I bookmark, uh, you know, as much as I can and go back to it. I want to have spare time sitting around, whether it's a, you know, waiting room somewhere, or I'm waiting for food somewhere, or I'm, you know, just got a few minutes to burn here and there. Yeah. I can attest to that. He used to be in the habit of at night would lay in bed and check Facebook. And then he decided, you know, I'm reading on Facebook. I might as well read something that's going to be effective. So then he traded his habit of Facebook for reading and he gets tons of books in. Um, Let's see here. For a married couple, how I'm interested in your question Uh for this. Uh, How important is it for the couple to minister together, especially in full time missions or short term missions? Well, I mean, I think that kind of answers itself. It's very important that both uh, husband and wife be involved in the vision God's given to to them as a family. Um, how important? I think it's very important. Is that the question? Yep. Yeah, I think it's very important. I know to some degree, and, and it may be what you're implying here, both spouse, both people in the marriage can't be as involved as they want to be. You can't have, you know, we still got kids to take care of, family to take care of, uh, bills to take care of. And so I think... Finding out, it's kind of like uh, Adam Smith's, you know, principle. Uh, everyone, both both people do their part, and together we make an impact in the overall, um, you know, impact we want to make in missions or whatever, or whatever yeah. the adventure is in the ministry. 
Uh, there's things that I can do that my wife can't do. There's things she can do that I can't do, like recording podcasts. <laughs> and so um, she does it. And so my, my goal is to encourage her to do it. And she encourages me in the ministry that I do in, in yeah. sense of travel and mission work outside the U.S. Yeah. And so as long as there's unity in the marriage or unity in the relationship, um, progressing toward the goal of what we feel God's called us to do, that's yeah. what you're shooting for. It's not so much, you know, it's never two equals. It's always... One person gives more than the other, but it's in different aspects of the ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that some, I've had some of our younger students who are married now um, struggle with this, where maybe one of them felt strongly called to ministry and the other one had felt strongly called to the business world. And they were like, how do we do this? Because, you know, ministry can be very all consuming. Mm -hmm. Um, It can also leave you feeling like you're operating in two different worlds. And how would you suggest to couples that find themselves in that kind of a position to honor each other's callings? That's, it's hard to answer that without knowing specifics, but I think the last part, which said honoring each other's calling is a big deal. Like honor is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then, especially when you're young in the ministry and in the workforce and just starting life off, the big question is the why. Why are you doing what you're doing? And if a lot of people, and I'm not you know, trying to be too critical, but a lot of people get into ministry because there's a sense of validation in it. They're doing it because they feel a certain way when they're helping people. And the danger of that is that feeling or a search for significance in the ministry or even in the business world or in your career many times becomes the thing that cripples you. Mm. And so if you're not spending time getting validation from the presence of God on a regular basis, it's easy to start making your identity in the ministry and your identity in your workplace, your identity even in relationship, the primary focus of what you do, and then all of a sudden it becomes an idol in your life. Mm. And spiritual idols are the most subtle ones that that get overlooked, mm-hmm. you know, people, oh, well, you know, I'm a preacher, I'm an evangelist, I'm a this, I'm a I'm prophet, I'm an apostle, I'm serving the Lord, so everyone should, you know, fall down and worship as I walk by or, <laughs> you know, realign their schedules around mine. And the truth is, you're not that important, you know, like the ministry is going to happen <laughs> and you're finding your validation in ministry. And what happens is uh, the Lord will work to remove that idol out of your life. And so yeah. most of the tension in relationships that I see is, one person has found validation in ministry and the other person, the spouse, whatever, has found that that's not going to work for them. And so mm-hmm. that's where that tension usually gets created. Yeah. And I think, too, like like even like Stephen was saying in the beginning, that as your seasons change, the way that you're involved in ministry or in the business world or whatever also changes. And every time you undergo a change for a married couple, that requires reevaluation and reassessing like, how you share the load or how you, um, how one will carry more weight while the other one's pursuing a goal. Yeah. And, um, and so there's an ebb and a flow to it and mm-hmm. being sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying. And I think, um, as Stephen touched on too, just maintaining and protecting that spirit of honor, recognizing that your calling is not more impar- important than your spouse's calling. Like you both are important to what the Lord is asking you to do. And you need to work together to support each other in fulfilling that calling. Because like I think of I, when, when the babies were younger and Stephen was going on missions trips, um, there were some missions trips that he'd come home and I was <laughs> so exhausted from toddlers <laughs> upon toddlers and infants that he'd be telling me about people that got saved and healed and delivered. And in my head, I was like, I don't freaking care. Just <laughs> let me go sleep right now. <laughs> like I was so tired. And so, but I also didn't want to be the barrier to him fulfilling mm-hmm. what I knew was God's call on his life. So we found a happy medium where when the kids were really young, he would build into the missions trip budget um, to pay for someone to come help me with the little ones while he was gone. And so we found ways to kind of meet in the middle and meet Mm -hmm. each other's needs. And it's been tremendously helpful. And um, so I think as everyone has their giftings Mm -hmm. uh, to consider, you have to treat your spouse like you'd want to be treated and honor their giftings like you want yours to be honored. Um, With that, I also wanted to say... Well, let me ask you first before I pitch into this. Mm -hmm. As a husband with a wife in ministry, (laughs) we've had lots of conversations about this. He's rolling his eyes. Um, 
what role do you feel like you carry as the head of the home and as a man and as my personal leader to make room for me to operate in ministry when I primarily have to take care of the kids? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, where have you seen a responsibility on your shoulders for what I'm able to do? I think this is a trap. This is not a trap. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find words for the question. You know, I think... Back to what I said earlier, like finding the place where you can abide, get in the presence of God, say, okay, Lord, what are you saying? The Lord will give you clear, gives clear direction, like, hey, I want you to do this. I want your wife to do this. And then I have to make room. Of, of course, um, ministry as a whole, at least in the U.S. and pretty much anywhere else I've been around the world, seems to be a male-dominated uh, genre of of work. And so uh, it's easy for women to get overlooked. And so men have to be very intentional to say, Hey, look, this is my wife and she's a part of the ministry and it's, she can pray for you just like I can pray for you. And so I think men in ministry, husbands in ministry have to make room for your wife. It won't just happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, it's like, and we see the pattern in scripture, like John the Baptist made room for Jesus you know, Jesus made room for his disciples. So we see that transference. And we even see like Jesus made room for the women that followed him in the mm-hmm. sense of he recognized them by name. He said, okay, mm-hmm. these these are the ones that he went to, you know, Martha, Mary, but he made room for them. And love always makes room for people because they're mm-hmm. just as important as you are. And so I think, yeah, that's kind of a big principle. Yeah, I agree. And I have, I think on that whole importance of couples in ministry, I think that can be one of the struggles that's present. And not every couple that's in ministry, the wife won't always feel a responsibility to be mm-hmm. right up there alongside her husband. Some For some women, they feel a calling to just manage their home. And mm-hmm. I think that's awesome um, because honestly, it, it, it makes it where they're less divided because mm-hmm. even though I feel a calling to ministry, I equally feel a responsibility to my home. So then in that way, sometimes I feel very divided because, yeah. you know, I feel drawn in two different directions. And But I have seen how Stephen, as my husband, like he just said, that if he doesn't make room for me, then, you know, no woman, no woman wants to be in a position where she feels like she has to promote herself mm-hmm. or establish herself because, you know, it just feels better to have room made for you. That's what yeah. honor does. And so Stephen and I have had to learn that. And it's come through communication and it's come through lots of tears on my part, you know, just, just pointing things out that he never recognized because he's not a woman, you know, and he won't feel it like I would feel it. And so it's come through communication and him listening and, and recognizing and acknowledging those things. And so I know you like to sketch and played violin. Mm. What other non-missions random skills do you have? I'm pretty sure oh, this is a Joe's Mary question. That's a Joe's Mary question for <laughs> sure. Uh, I don't know about skills. That's kind of a assuming word. Uh, I mean, I like to hunt. Uh, I like to like to read. Um, I think the older I get, the less risk, of, the more risk averse I become, and so uh, the more what risk? risk averse? Oh, the game. <laughs> <laughs> I'll help it. So yeah, I don't think there's too many more besides that. He plays guitar. I do play guitar a little bit. He can bit. play bass, mm-hmm. and he used to rock some per- percussion. We'll give him a djembe. He can keep a good beat. Necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at our last church, he would lead worship many times. He didn't ever, like, that was never the thing he was chasing after. It was definitely the necessity <laughs> of the moment. Um, but it was always very sweet and always really great worship. Like, always the presence of the Lord came. Probably because it was a offering of sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you didn't want to no do it. No comments there. No comments. <laughs> Okay, um, silly question, but when you discovered who God called you to be, did you ever hesitate or want to run from the calling that was placed on your life? Okay, that is not a silly question. Um, also curious how you got saved, and have you always read like you currently do? We kind of touched on the reading. Yeah, I don't, I think the more you read, the more, uh, the more you like it, as far as if you find good, a series of good books or a good trail to follow. Uh, as far as the calling, I think every minister goes through those seasons uh, of doubt whether I should be doing this, not be doing this. And then, of course, the longer you do it, the more confident you become. Mm-hmm. So to answer the question at the beginning, there's great levels of questioning in the sense of, am I doing the right thing? Not necessarily am I doing supposed to be in the ministry, but am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing in the ministry? Um, but you find that 
identity in ministry is not found by just being put into the right category. It's found by saying, I'm going to serve no matter where I am. And then your gifting starts taking taking root. And I think a lot of times young young ministers jump into the ministry thinking, well, once I find my first, my my suitable place in ministry, whether it be youth ministry or worship ministry or prophetic ministry or whatever, you know, then I'm going to be really flourishing or then I'm going to really flourish. And that's really not the truth. The truth is you find a place to serve and then you'll start flourishing. Like the giftings will start coming out, like Mm -hmm. find where there's the greatest need. I wouldn't say the greatest, just the most apparent need. And you go in and start serving. One of the hardest things we've, I've found in ministry is it's hard to find people with a servant heart that's consistent. Yeah. A lot of people want to serve until they get recognition. And then all of a sudden they don't need to serve anymore. And real ministry is about serving indefinitely, like <laughs> consistently serving the people that God's put in your hands or put in front of you to say, I'm just going to serve you. I'm going to serve you and serve you. And if you do take the low road on that, you'll find promotion comes. But when promotion comes, you'll realize it's not about promotion. It's still about serving. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. How did you come to know the Lord? That's a long story. Can you give us the Reader's Digest version? And I would say you can go to my blog, stephensamuel.org, <laughs> and read it. <laughs> shameless plug. <laughs> okay, so then uh, last question I'm going to throw in my own, and then we're going to get into life hacks with Jen and Stephen. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so what is your favorite thing to do for downtime when you are unwinding, unplugging, trying to refresh yourself? Well... I.e., where can people get you gift cards to? Just oh, kidding. gift cards. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think there's two things. I like to go to Starbucks and drink coffee and read. True that. And then I uh, usually, at when I'm unwinding, watch a wonderful episode of Andy Griffith yep. <laughs> and unwind, and that's about it. And I already own all the Andy Griffiths, so no need on that one. I can vouch for the integrity of those answers. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, on our honeymoon, I think we went to Starbucks every day. And then when I took him to Disneyland, this is a great story. I had dreamed my whole life. I grew up going to Disneyland because we lived not far. And it was always my dream. I'd see these cute romantic couples kissing in line and whatever, being all sweet. And I was like, if I can't get married at Disneyland, I want to bring my true love with me. And I'll be like a princess with my prince in the land of magic. So finally my dreams came true. And my parents, we had been married like, two and a half years or something, Mm -hmm. they kept Judah and sent me and my siblings and Steven to Disneyland for Christmas. It was wonderful. It was cold, but it was wonderful. And so we went and it was so great. And Steven is like bored out of his mind, totally not interested in any of the things Disney had to offer. (laughs) So at one point we're like waiting in line and he's like, Hey, I'm going to run to the car and get something. I'll be right back. And I'm like, okay, cool. So, like, two hours later, I'm like, where did my brown husband run off to? And I text him, and I'm like, babe, where are you? I know the park is big, but really? And he goes, oh, I got a book out of the car, and I'm reading in the coffee shop on Main Street at Disneyland. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So, he's not lying when he says he loves a coffee shop and a good book. So, anyways. Okay, well, thank you, babe, for answering all of those questions. We're going to jump into... Life Hacks with Jen. Okay, babe, so what are some practical things? You talked about budgeting, you talked about books, you talked about giving on missions. Throw us some good stuff. You know, the foundation for everything we do comes from from knowing God's Word. I got an app, and it was like $5, whatever, called Verses, V-E-R-S-E-S, Verses, to start memorizing Scripture. Oh. And so as a minister, and maybe some, well, you don't even have to be a minister, but just if you want to start getting God's word in your heart versus it's a, it's not a free app, but it's worth the investment is a great way to start programming your mind to memorize. How does it function? Plug in the verses or you select the text that you want to memorize. And then it creates like, you know, little games for you to play, flashcards, different ways to memorize a verse. So that's a good app. And so cool. I'm guessing life hacks pr- predominantly in our culture now comes down to finding suitable apps to do things through. Okay. Uh, the second one, which is not an app, uh, when we talk about missions and giving and stuff, the, the primary reason most people can't be generous is because they're overwhelmed with debt. They're strapped down. 
So I would encourage you, if you haven't already done it, and of course at our church, Cathedral Church here in Beaumont, we offer it every semester, but you need to go through a budgeting class. Dave Ramsey has some incredible uh, tools, and if you're not budgeting, you're not you have no idea what's happening in your finances. Yeah. And so I use the envelope method, which Dave Ramsey teaches. Uh, I don't use envelopes. Literally, I use kind of an online system that we've created at our credit union, number of checking accounts. Um, but if you haven't, if you want to get to a place of generosity, you need to get out of significant amount of debt. Uh, you need to get to where you're, you can breathe in your finances. And budgeting is the key. And it's not a quick solution. It's not like mm-hmm. a one-week solution, two-week solution. It takes about three months to get a good budget going and working and operating in a place where you feel like you can breathe. Yeah. Um, sometimes longer, depending on where you're at financially. Yeah. Um, I have I use an app called Evernote, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar, and there's probably comparable apps. But I find a lot of times I come up with great ideas, or I think they're great ideas, and maybe they're not. But I don't have a way to write it down, and I don't have a notepad. I don't have a notepad and a pen around. So I use Evernote, uh, and I create like little notebooks of just book ideas or co- speaking ideas or sometimes ideas, things to do with the kids. And so I pull that app up, type it in real quick. And I use that on a regular basis. I also have... Um, well, another- hold on. What Go I ahead. love about Evernote is you can insert photos. You can insert audio clips. You can um, upload, like if you have stuff saved to your phone, you can share it to your Evernote app and it'll save files. You can organize your files by <coughs> folders. And um, it's just super... You can sync it where other people are accessible to specific folders Um mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just so helpful, and it syncs between all your devices, and it's accessible online. You can go into the Evernote website and log on. Mm-hmm. I use it as well, obviously, and it's just super helpful. Yeah, that's a great app to have. And then, of course, everybody should use a calendar app. I think a lot of times frustration comes in life when we have limited amount of time mm-hmm. to put out quality work or quality ideas. And so if you're not planning your week regularly, then your week is kind of planning you, and that usually causes frustration. So I set aside time, usually the beginning of every week, whether it's a Sunday night or a Monday morning, and kind of plan out the week and look at my calendar and see what's coming up. If you don't do that, it's hard to be a leader if you don't know what's happening in your life yeah. in the week ahead. And so calendar, there's tons of calendar apps. I just use the regular one that's in a, in my phone. Um, there's also another app called Any Do, Any period Do, do D-O, um, that is also like a to-do list kind of app that's, I think it's free. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are kind of the apps that make life a little bit more accessible um, for me. Uh, as far as reading goes, like I mentioned earlier, Kindle is a great resource, audible.com, that app. I use that for the audio books. And uh, just a little tip on that. When I find an author that I really like, let's say, I, uh, you know, when I first started reading, I discovered Philip Yancey. And then Yancey, in his book, would cite other authors. So he would cite, you know, guys that we know, C.S. Lewis um, and those things. And so I would find those authors and then read all of their books. So usually the longer an an author has been writing, the better his books get. So you kind of go backward in time. So you start with the most recent and kind of go back. Uh, Because usually an author's first work is their hardest one to read because they're still (laughs) learning how to write. So you need to love them first. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, unless unless they're a Rabbi Zacharias or something like that. But you'll find that they get better as they write. And so how do you read more books? You find books that you like to read. You Mm -hmm. don't force feed yourself books that you don't like because then you'll start despising it and (laughs) then, you know, have this idea of I want to be this great reader, but I hate the book I'm reading right now. And so just remember there's tons of authors that are writing on same topics. And so if you get one that you just can't read or it's very hard – there's another author out there that's put in the work to make it more readable. Mm-hmm. The average person reads at about a fifth grade, sixth grade reading level. Cool. That's not to say people are dumb. It's just they don't want to do the work of thinking about every sentence. Mm-hmm. And so if you have to think about every sentence, like, and I'll, I'll give you some examples, not to be critical, but like if you read A.W. Tozer, you're not getting through a Tozer book <laughs> in a week no. like, and getting what you can get out of it. You have to think about what he's saying because he's saying it in a unique way and he's kind of older English kind of feel in his writings, and so you have to process it a little bit more. C.S. Lewis, the same thing. You have to think about what he's saying, uh, but there's more modern or more current authors that say the same things, but they have a more fluid way of saying it where you don't have to think about it, do a lot of intellectual acrobatics. Yeah. Um, like that's Joyce what, Meyer, she's easy. 
very easy. Uh, Alex Ravi Zacharias, he's really good. Abdu Murray, really good. Vince Vitale, those guys who are kind of in the apologetics genre, but they're really good writers. Chris Valton, kind of a little bit more on your charismatic side, he's a good writer. Yeah, he is. Uh, so there's really good writers out there that are talking about what you want to learn about. Don't get stuck in a rut of trying to read an author because they're the only one that you think that's talking about this. Most times that's not the case. Okay, so one more practical place. Mm -hmm. A lot of these questions were about how to get involved in missions uh, right now, even if you can't leave Mm -hmm. American soil. So Mm -hmm. what would you recommend practically? I think relationships are how missions happen. And so you start with the people you know. um, What are they doing? Getting involved in their life, talking to them just on a regular basis is a big deal. And then doing what you can right with the people that you have a relationship with. There's no fast fast track to becoming, you know, impacting the world of missions. It takes time because this is a marathon. We're trying to change communities, and that doesn't happen in one week. It happens year over year of people giving their life. And so when you partner with people on a regular basis, not just financially but in prayer and in communication and maybe short-term mission trips, um, I would say that's a big benefit. If you want to do missions, you got to first start at square one. You need to go get a passport. After you get a passport, you need to start saving money to go. Mm. Um, there's always the, the debate of, you know, is it better to give money or to go? And I would say both. Uh, but usually the first thing you do is learn how to give, and then you start planning to go. That, at least that's been my experience. I've started giving to missions long before I ever went on a trip. Okay, hold on. Now, you're in the missions world. You have lots of opportunities to go places. Mm-hmm. Most people, you say you need to go, and they're like, uh where do I go? Who do I go Mm -hmm. with? What do I do? Where do I start? What would you say? Um, I would say you start with your local church. You find out the path. Every pastor is approached by missionaries on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so if you're like, I want to go on a mission trip, talk to your senior pastor or whoever the missions director is at your church and say, I'd like to go on a trip. And most pastors, you need to be ready or missions directors will not just say, Hey, you need to go. They're going to make sure you're prepared. Yeah. Uh, and so, like at our church, we people that want to go, we really encourage them to go through the school of ministry or go through a life group or go through some form of training so when they get out on the mission field, it's not like a, I'm learning how to lead people to Jesus on the field. You need to know those kind of things before you go. Um, so I would say the way to get ready or the way to start is not so much finding the right person, but begin to prepare yourself for the work, and you'll find that in preparation— there are many thing, many opportunities that begin to open up to you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, practical here. How do they get a passport? Uh, most passports you can get at your local post office. And if the one you're at doesn't offer it, they can tell you uh, where to go to get it. Okay. And that's really the application. You don't actually get the passport no, there. You, you get the fill out the application there. You mail it in with the... With the picture. With your pictures and the cost. And they'll walk you through the whole process there at the yeah. post office. Okay. Yeah. Post office would not have been where I would have thought to go. <laughs> get a passport if I had not known. Yep. Um, okay. Now, what about if their church, say it's a small church and they don't have a missions um, opportunity through their local church, mm-hmm. what uh, organizations do you recommend they could partner with? Um, you know, we're connected to a, quite a few. There's Assemblies of God World Missions, agwm.org. Uh, there's a huge organization right here in San Antonio uh, called C10. That's Christ. I'm trying to remember what C10 stands for. To Every Nation. Christ to Every Nation. C10. It's a great organization. Uh, there's tons of missions organizations. But I think. Operation Blessing. Operation Blessing. That's a lot of domestic work. And they do a lot of international work as well. That's a great resource. Mm-hmm. Um there's plenty of them, I mean, I think. But I would start with your local church, and if, even if your church doesn't have a missions pastor, your pastor should know missions organizations that, that are connected in your yeah. network. I would, yeah, I would say just Googling and finding an organization is not necessarily going to be your safest or best option because there are lots of scam things out there. Yeah, that's why relationship is so important. Yeah. Like, I mean... I. Probably every week I get a Facebook request from somebody in Africa that's, you know, sometimes legitimate, sometimes not legitimate, asking for money. There's no way for me to validate that or verify that what they're saying is happening is happening. Uh, If you Google long enough, you'll find out that everyone knows the right verbiage to say, the right buzzwords to throw out there, the right pictures to put up, the right videos to create, Mm -hmm. um, because we're in such a technologically advanced community. Like validating things by seeing video and hearing 
sound bites is just not a great way to go. That's why relationship is such a big part. And that's why we go so many times to see what's happening, not in a critical sense or in a analytical sense, but just we want to be see what the work is ha- what work is happening and how we can be a part. So I'd say relationship is a big deal. So if you can meet with the missionaries, if you can talk with them and then go where they're at, that's kind of the the long-term plan, but tr- finding people that you trust and that they've validated or verified the missions that you want to be a part of. Yeah. It's a great place to start. Yeah, I agree. Um, <coughs> then how about, final question, if people want to support you on missions or just the, say, missions that you're connected with, mm-hmm. um, can they do that and how can they do that? They can. We have a website uh, for Free Life Missions. It's flmissions.org. And you can go there. There's not a whole lot of information on the page just because a lot of the work that we do is in areas where we can't publicize what we do, but there's that's our webpage. You can go check that out. You can also get on Facebook or whatever and follow us around. Okay. Is that something that they can sign up to go on a trip with you? Uh, the same response that I gave earlier, like, yes, you can, but there is, like, we need, I tend to vet everyone that goes with us. So, mm-hmm. like, what training do they have? What experience do they have? Mm-hmm. And then probably talk to their pastors or leaders to see if they're, uh, able to do it, not so much like we're looking for this great theologian to go with us, but just, you know, are you able to do the tasks that we'll be doing yeah. in various countries that we go? Okay, and last question. Uh, you mentioned the School of Ministry. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that something that any listener could participate in from a distance, or do they have to be here? Uh, currently, it's it's just local, but we're looking at going online. I don't have a date for that yet. Hopefully this year, early part of next year, we'll be able to go online, and you can go to the Beaumont Revival School of Ministry. Uh, again, we're working on the developing the web page and everything, so I don't have a URL to give right now, but you can go to icathedral.org, and once it's available, you'll be able to find it on that site. Awesome. All right. Thank you, babe, for mm-hmm. coming on the podcast today. It's great to have you. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's show. For those of you who've rated or shared this podcast on social media, thank you. It really means a lot to me. And don't forget, you can always email me with questions or comments at javawithjenpodcast at gmail.com. And for links or show notes, just go visit my blog at jennaleesamuel.wordpress.com. Until next time, you've got this and God's got you.